Elimination Unit, Introduction to Nursing Concepts, Martha Olson. Nursing care before and after the urinary elimination test is very important because NCLEX wants to know, are you safe? Do you know what type of prep they will need and what kind of safety things do we need to do for them afterwards? On page 1055 in your powder and peri, it lists them as either non-invasive or invasive. The first ones listed here are your non-invasive. Cystoscopy and arteriography are invasive and need a consent. And then your urinalysis at the bottom here would be done first, and that is very non-invasive, oftentimes done. With our urinalysis, we screen for renal diseases, urinary tract infections, many of our metabolic diseases. It does not uh, require a sterile specimen, but we do put it in a sterile cup, and it needs to be taken down to the lab right away. It can't just sit and uh, become warm, or, or it will grow bacteria that should not be there. The client voids into the clean cup. We can use a brand new urinal or a brand new bedpan and collect it from that, uh, but not one that's been rinsed out. They have to void before defecating so it's not contaminated with any feces. And if a woman is menstruating, remember to um, make note of that because it will probably have some red blood cells in it. When we look at urine, we look at um, the intake and output. It's talked about on page 1052. Remember, we use a graduate set of piece of paper, um, a paper towel on the floor, then set the graduate on top of that so we have that barrier. And then make sure you rinse that graduate after you're done collecting the urine from the, the bag. The factors that affect urination, there's many of them on page 1046 in Potter and Perry. The medications, it, costs, it discusses many of them that cause dysfunction or change color to the urine, and that's good to know because many people will not know that certain red food colorings can uh, discolor the urine. Also, take a look at the specific gravity that's talked about in Powder and Perry. That is the weight or degree of concentration, and it's always part of a urinalysis, so it kind of tells how heavy that urine is. Our sterile specimen then is obtained by getting the catheter into the person. It's much more invasive. We run a higher risk of uh, giving the patient a hospital acquired or healthcare acquired uh, infection or nosocomial. So we either do it with a straight cath or a mini cath to obtain that sterile specimen. And like I said, very few cases do we uh, obtain our UA like that because of the risk for infection. To get it from an indwelling catheter, remember we have to get it from that sampling port that's between the, the rubber part of the catheter that goes into the patient and the tubing. We pinch that off for a period of three to five minutes to collect some urine in that area by the sampling port. We uh, cleanse it very well then with an alcohol wipe, put a 10 milliliter uh, sterile syringe on that and then withdraw the urine from that sampling port. It's not very hard to do, and it is something that uh, helps us to be able to obtain that specimen of urine very easily. With an upper GI or barium swallow, we're uh, using a contrast medium. It requires the patient to not eat or drink NPO. They need a consent. The bowel will be cleansed with a prep the day before. And then anytime we give a patient barium, we need to make sure that they are given the laxatives after the exam. For a patient to tell you, I don't need that laxative, um, strongly encourage it because barium is very constipating. And three days down the road when they're trying to defecate with a very hard brick-like stool, they will wish they had taken your advice for that laxative. Other diagnostic exams, the KUB stands for kidneys, ureter, bladder, and that requires a bowel cleansing and a liquid diet after the test. Our scopes then go into the body, so they are considered uh, invasive, and we would need a consent for those. And we'll talk here in a minute about the colonoscopies because they are very commonly done looking for cancer or other conditions of the colon that uh, can help us to know why the patient is having the symptoms that they are. The abdominal uh, retrogram, or KUB then, is just a flat plate of the abdomen. It's done very easily, and it helps us assess the gross structures as we then would delve into the other tests that tell us more. Because the kidneys are located, it is necessary to do a bowel prep so that we aren't uh, having bowel uh, 
matter in the way of that test. And then the IVP is uh, the entire urinary system looking for some kind of uh, dysfunction with that. Our nursing inf inf implications before an IVP, make sure that we uh, look at their allergies to make sure they're not allergic to something that could cause an allergic reaction for them. Uh, for many, uh, with this dye that goes in, if they're allergic to iodine, they will also uh, have problems with this. It's nephrotoxic, and so with your older adult, make sure that we are uh, giving them plenty of fluid, assessing their kidney function beforehand, and that's your BUN and creatinine, so that uh, they are able to eliminate that dye then from the body after the test is completed. During the test then, the client oftentimes will tell you, I feel metallic tasting in my mouth. Remember that contrast, uh, any allergies to shellfish, iodine, usually they will be allergic to the IVP dye. If your patient would start having an allergic reaction during the IVP, they usually give Benadryl. You have the crash cart there with all of the rescue medications in case you would uh, get to that point of needing them. Before an IVP, they'll be NPO. They give them the dye through your IV, so you'll want an 18 or maybe 20 IV site to be able to use. And then they will feel hot or flush during that uh, as that dye then circulates through the body. After the test, again, they need to resume their diet, but we will try to push the fluid so that that uh, dye can be eliminated from the body. Uh, it can be nephrotoxic or toxic to the kidney, so again, get the dye out as soon as we can when that test is done. Monitor intake and output. Other tests that were are done, oftentimes the renal scan, the CT scan to visualize, and most of our small hospitals in this area have CT scan at every facility, so they're very easy to do. Not too long ago, they would have to wait for the truck that had the CT scanner in it to be able to do tests on their patients. And the ultrasound, again, uses the ultrasound waves to visualize any abnormalities of the kidney or lower tract to help us identify what is uh, going on. The cystoscopy is a scope that goes in and visualizes the bladder and urethra. The patient lies still and they go up and are able to biopsy in case there is a, a cancer or metastasis. We watch for urinary retention afterwards simply because if that scope causes swelling to the urethra, they will then not be able to eliminate the urine after the test. So get a hat in the room, make sure you tell them we're watching for intake and output. Encourage the fluids to flush the bacteria that might have been introduced during the scope from that lower uh, urinary system. And then your signs of systemic infection would be your fever, dysuria, and hypotension for them. Probably the most severe test that we're going to talk about is the angiogram, and that's where they put the dye in to be able to see the vascular supply of the kidneys. This is kind of a step down uh, from any uh, procedure they have, so we will get vital signs when they come back very frequently, like every 15 minutes times four, every half an hour times two. They will be on complete bed rest for four to eight hours with some kind of pressure dressing or sand bag to that groin area where they uh, went into that vein to be able to complete this test. You always want to check your pulses downstream from where they were assessing that vein. And so usually on the leg or the extremity of that side, you will check pedal pulses, circulation. Are they able to wiggle? Do they have a blood flow to that area and capillary refill that returns within three seconds? Monitor intake and output. Again, we encourage fluids to flush that contrast dye from their system and checking the circulation in the leg and that site for bleeding are typical questions you might see on your NCLEX questions because it's safety. When we look at the scope for the bowels, they're commonly done. They, it is a same-day surgery procedure. The person gets the directions and they're prep from the clinic where they see their doctor and set this test up. They need very clear directions as to their diet, how and when they start the prep, and what they can expect from that. What they are looking for is any polyps, which are precancer, hernias, 
you know, Crohn's disease, all of that can be seen through the scope when they go up from the anus up into that person's uh, lower colon. The nursing care before and after, uh, clear liquid, bowel cleanser, usually a product called Go Lightly or Meg Citrate is used. Then the morning of, they will give enemas till clear. And remember, we only give three enemas. Anything more than that, if their bowel is not cleaned out, you need to be calling the surgeon that will be doing or the physician that will be doing the colonoscopy. They're NPO so they don't aspirate. And then because they get um, a sedation and also have a risk for injury to that bowel, like a perforation, they would need a consent signed. Your worst case scenario is perforation of that bowel where they get a very big peritonitis and would be on antibiotics and possibly even have to have surgery to repair that uh, part of the bowel that was uh, perforated through with the scope. People that are at risk for perforation, remember anybody with a weak colon wall. If they have polyps, removal of polyps, diverticuli, your Crohn's disease, all of those types of bowel disorders are going to be very high risk for complications uh, from your uh, colonoscopy or endoscopy. An upper GI or barium swallow would be done before the colonoscopy. That's where they uh, visualize the upper part of the gastrointestinal system again that's NPO status and our nursing considerations are keeping them NPO, checking for that gag reflex after it's done, making sure the consent is on the chart and then afterwards because they got barium we need to encourage fluids and also encourage the laxative so that they are not very constipated from that barium that has uh, a potential to cause problems. One of the new articles that I read that pertains very well to this unit is an article that was in Nursing 2012 that talks about a medication that is not constipating. It's not a laxative, but it helps people uh, that are, are possible cancer patients that are taking a lot of opioids for their uh, cancer pain to not cause them to be constipated. It is a med called methyl naloxetrone and it's one that um, this article talks about that I thought would be interesting and um, evidence-based practice to um, present to you at this time. It displaces the peripheral mu receptors. It's a sub-Q med that's given every other day only as needed and no other bowel interventions are needed with this. So something that you might uh, take to Cindy or your other instructors or as you're looking at patients that have constipation as a result of being on some of the opioid medications, this is something new that we are reading about. And lastly to think, which is more serious, urinary incontinence or urinary retention? I hope this has been a good uh, review of the tests that go with the uh, elimination unit. Have a great day. Thanks.